takes care of his enemies and establishes the millennial reign. How many think when the millennial reign you're going to have a jubilee? But we're in a prophetic jubilee that God is restoring. How many of us need restoring this morning? There is an unction of the Holy Ghost to restore everything the enemy has ever stolen from you needs to come back. All the junk the enemy's put in your life to hold you down, he needs to take back. I think the UPS man has got a lot of work to do in the days to come. This morning we dealt with learning to be a mountain taker. We also learned that God is releasing a Caleb anointing. Caleb said at 40, we can take that land, that at nothing. Had to wait till he was 85 before he could go in because of the unbelief of others. But the word says, his testimony was, I'm as strong now at 85 as I was at 40. You youngins, get out of the way. I got a mountain I got to take. This morning, I want to deal with becoming a giant killer. And I think it's very appropriate the youth are here. Because when we read the story of David, there are some giants that grown men and mature men will run and hide in foxholes, but yet there is an anointing that can come on youth to take the giant down. And so I don't care if you're 13 or 103, I want to preach to you this morning because all of us have giants that we need to take down. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to 1 Samuel 17. And this morning, I'm not going to be wandering all over the Word. I'm just going to kind of park it right here in 1 Samuel 17. I've heard some of my students tell me that when uh, I really get the teaching and preaching hard, it's like having a Bible drill for an hour and a half. But we're just going to kind of park it in one area this morning. Every one of us, guys, have a giant or more in our lives that we've got to kill. That giant is between you and your blessing, you and your destiny, between you and what God really wants in your life. And you can ignore him, but as long as you ignore him, you're never going to make any progress. You're stuck in a hole. Now, you can turn it into a man cave, <laughs> flat panel, 52 inch, 400 stations with an Xbox, but it's still just a hole. God has a whole lot more for you. If you found 1 Samuel 17 yet, I want to start here with verse 8, and I want to look at the protocol of the giants. How many know that the enemy has a tactic when he comes at you? He doesn't do it half, uh, half baked. He doesn't do it haphazard. There is a strategic approach to coming against you that is tailor made for you. So when we come against the enemy, we cannot do it half baked. We cannot do it off the cuff. There are divine protocols to come against the protocols he uses against you. We pick up in verse 8, and he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do you come out to draw up into battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. One thing I have discovered about giants, they all got big mouths. You know what I'm talking about. Now, I, I can kind of compare that and the difference between Goliath and David. Now, David finally had to do his own little trash talk a little bit too. But giants prefer to intimidate. 
They like to trash talk. How many have ever had the devil trash talk you? You're never going to mount anything. Who do you think you are? Why should you be doing this? Blah, blah, blah. It goes on forever. And if he can get you to back down before you fight, he's already won. I remember when I was in the military, and usually the guy that could fight the least talked the most. And on the concern that I was at, and I was at 3rd Infantry Division in Germany, and so every little small military base will have a place where you can go get a soda or a beer or whatever, you can play pool, and it's all kind of in together. And a bunch of us were there just to have some hot dogs and, and play pool and fellowship. Well, they also had a bar in there, and there was a ruckus going on. That kind of happens sometimes with military, doesn't it? But we had these dudes come in that didn't wear rank. They were, they were special forces. And not only were they special forces, we, we kind of believed from the, some of the stuff they were doing, they were Delta, which is secret special forces. Okay. One of them was sitting at the bar enjoying his hot dog and his beer, and you have chairs flying, you have guys screaming, maybe a tooth or two flying kind of through the air. He turned and looked at that, and it happened to bother his meal. He slapped his hand down and said, that'll be enough. Do you know you could hear a pin drop? Because yeah. everybody knew who he was. This was a guy who says, you want communism to come down? Give me a toothpick. <laughs> He's that kind of guy. In other words, he knew who he was. He knew who his, what his authority was. He had confidence in his abilities and the skills of war. He didn't have to trash talk. That's kind of where we need to become. And for a lot of us, the first giant that you're going to come against is in your youth. Because it's standing between you and maturity, and really it's the first of many giants. You know, one of the reasons David took five stones is because we find out later in the Word, Goliath had four other brothers. And so if Bubba 1 and Bubba 2 and Bubba 3 and Bubba 4 come out to defend their brother, he's going to take that. i got a rock for every one of you jacks, man. And you read on later on in the Scriptures in his life, he did hunt down the other four brothers and kill them. But the enemy likes to use intimidation. If God be for you, who can be against you? We need to take an inventory of our life and say, what is causing intimidation in my life? Because you sometimes giants will hide in the shadows, but you feel the intimidation and you need to take the light of the word to shine on them to discover where they are so that you can confront them. Not all of them are as bold as Goliath. God does not intimidate you. He encourages you. He's the one patting you on the back saying, go get him, boy, I'm with you. He's not the one, you know, trying to push you down. How many know the difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation says, you dirty dog, look what you did. Who do you think you are? You're never going to amount to anything. That's the devil. Some people call that the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's a giant. It's a, it's a devil speaking to you. God will come to you and say, you know you was wrong. Mm. Come on, talk to me now. Tell me. Tell me what you did. Let's talk it over. Let's find out where the devil got in. Let's repent of it. Let's get the blood of Jesus on it. And then learn from it so that you never do it again. That's God. God always gives hope. He gives conviction and then he gives hope. And he restores. But if you're being intimidated by something this morning, it's a giant. Now here's the funny thing about giants. There is a protocol with them that when you face them in battle, if you do not conquer that giant, you will become its slave. 
How many people do we know that live a life of could have been, should have been, but never was because they faced the giant and instead of standing in who they were in God, they cowered down and became its slave. Now, there's even some dynamics with that. How many know that giants aren't natural? Six-fingered, six-toed. We even finding out some of them had more than one row of teeth. Genesis 6 tells us that they're the byproduct of fallen angels getting together with mankind. In fact, many theologians believe that, remember the flood killed so many of them? There are disembodied spirits where we get demons. So David was staring down a demon with flesh. Now that ought to get you excited. Because I read someplace where you got authority over demons. Doesn't matter if they got a body, nobody, or somebody. It don't matter. It's got to bow the knee. And one of the things I found out about authority... A little child can move in authority the same way a full-grown man can. In the spirit realm, there's no such thing as age. Now, on this side of the equation, we can get more wisdom and understanding in how to move in that authority. But once you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you are given full authority in your life. If it comes in your realm, in your area of authority, you have the right to bind it up. Doesn't matter what age you are. I've seen children cast out demons. I've seen them heal the sick. I remember one time, this great man of faith that I am, I was homesick, and as my kids were little, I prayed. I was getting sicker, went to the doctor, and still getting sicker. It's one of those things, Lord, you know, this thing or I need relief, one or the other. You know, sometimes you're praying, you know, I don't want to go home, but if going home is relief. And I remember laying in the bed sick and my little girls. You know, I'm laying there sick and all of a sudden I start seeing this little yellow hair kind of perk around the, the edge of the bed. And Daddy, we're going to pray for you. And I'm thinking, I'll take anything. You know? <laughs> this don't hit me in the head with a Barbie doll when you're doing it, you know. They prayed for me, and instantly that thing left. Instantly it left. Because Jesus said you have to have faith as a child. Faith in Him. Youth. Even the Apostle Paul said, "Don't don't let the older people despise your youth. God's got something in you that's worthwhile. God's got something powerful in you. And God is saying, why don't you roll up your sleeves and work with me so that I can cultivate that and work that and to make it something wonderful. And you're fortunate to be in this church. How many know you guys get fed well here? You guys get fed well. You know, Mary and I have learned a lot of things over the last 20 years, some of the things we've been going through and and in my 50s now, and things are beginning to, to squeak and creak and not quite work right. And I told my wife, I said, man, if I knew what, when I was 21, what I know now, boy, I'd tear something up for Jesus. You know? You're in a place to learn it now. You're in, a, you're in a place that cultivates spiritual growth and spiritual determination Don't take it for granted. Use every bit of it that you can get. Milk it for all it's worth. Get so hungry in God that all the elders have got to hit the books to be able to keep up with you. Come on. Oh, no, we're we're, we're spoiled in America. I go to a, a spiritual son's church in Mexico. All the little kids come up. They're trilingual. Spanish, English, and Hebrew. And then babies, when they're learning to speak and read English and Spanish, they're learning to read Hebrew. So by the time all of them graduate from high school, they're fluent in Hebrew. They can pick up a Bible in Hebrew and begin to lecture from it. You're a whole lot smarter, and you have the ability to learn a whole lot more. 
than what everybody around you has been telling you. Your potential in God is virtually unlimited. God can prepare you for anything. Now, I want to get into the secrets of David because, yeah, the enemy wants to intimidate you. The enemy wants to enslave you. But we have a God who wants to set you free. Let's pick up again in verse 36. Look at what he says here. Your servant hath killed both the lion and the bear. Now, underline this in your Bible. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them uncircumcised that Philistine had no covenant with the God of heaven and earth David based everything that he could do it has to start with covenant not with his talent not he, he didn't say now you know what I'm bad with a slingshot the slingshot was bad in his hand because of the covenant you got to learn your covenant with God and what it really means to walk in covenant. Covenant is the most powerful thing in the universe. You can come in covenant with the creator of heaven and earth. And here's the way covenant would work if, if Brother Ricky and I come into, into blood covenant. Everything he has now belongs to me, and everything that I have now belongs to him. So it's at a, it, either one at our disposals when we need it. If he's in trouble, I immediately come to his side to stand with him and to fight for him. If I'm in trouble, he raises up immediately and stands and fights with me. That is a part of covenant. Every time you take communion, you are being reminded that Almighty God came down and shed His blood to come into blood covenant with you. And now He is saying, give me everything you got, and I'm going to give you everything I got. That's better than let's make a deal. Come on now. Now that, that may be dated. I don't know if they even still have that on TV or not. I'm showing my age, aren't I? Besides the gray in my beard. But God is saying, listen, you, if you will give me unrestricted access to your life, let me be Lord over every single area. I'm going to give you unrestricted access to who I am and what I have. David could have went with Goliath with a pea shooter. And that P would have took his head off because of who he was in covenant with. You see, that barren lion didn't have any covenant. And he said, this guy's just like him. No difference. And I think it's interesting, David called him an animal before he called David a dog. He said he's not, he's, he's not in covenant. He has nothing but that which he can muster out of his own talent and his own strength. But I serve a God that sent a guy down and all he had was a stick in his hand and said, let my people go. With a man who had armies. That's the kind of God we serve. That, that's what God wants to do in your life. Your heart's cry needs to be, Father, teach me my covenant. He said, I don't have much. Well, I saw a, a little young man that had just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves. He fed 5,000 men plus all the other and then had 12 baskets left over. Why 12? It was to represent divine government. Divine government was established when he gave what he had from God. You want God's government established in your life? He always takes little and makes it into much. Because even the best of us really just have little if we're honest with ourselves. Come on now. It's kind of like with that introduction. You get to a place in your life, they're introducing somebody, and you want to look behind and say, who is this guy they're talking about, you know? Because you realize it's, it's not you doing it, it's what Christ has done in you and is doing through you. 
And it, it, it's really handy because you can't get impressed in yourself because you know you didn't do it. You get impressed in who he is and what he has done and because of his covenant with you guys. Learn your covenant backwards and forward. Know it. Have absolute confidence in it. Covenant is everything. No carnal weapon can stand and prevail against a giant. I look at that and I said, boy, you know, if I had a minigun, you know, hello, giant. You know, they didn't have that back then. But there's giants. There's no, there's no carnal weapon. Because that wouldn't even work with the Raphaim because in the very name they, they had the ability to heal. That's why the, in, in the Torah they all freaked out. Moses killed Og. Well, Og was a Raphaim. You stick him, pull it out, it goes, heals back up. Until he got to Moses. You see, the devil, God can use you to give the devil some blows that won't heal up. Come on. No carnal weapon can stand to prevail against a giant, but no giant can stand to prevail against the covenant of God. That's why covenant is so important. Know your covenant with God and have confidence in that covenant, not in the weapons of warfare. You know how many times, a lot of us learn at church, we learn behavior, we learn the, the rondai shandais and the, you know, and, and, and sometimes, come on now, sometimes it's the Holy Ghost moving on you, and it's sometimes because Billy's looking. If we think we can just get her, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive the devil off. <laughs> Covenant. Covenant. Don't have faith in anything else. Covenant. Covenant can turn anything into your hands into a weapon to take down the giant. Let's jump on down to verse 40. And he took his stick in his hand. <laughs> Here another guy goes with a stick. He said, I learned from Moses. Let me take a stick. And chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch, and a sling in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Now prior to this, now, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. And he tries to take his armor and put on somebody about a foot and a half shorter. David looked at this one. This ain't going to work. I'll trip myself before I even get out there. Soared a lot longer than he needed. Couldn't probably handle it right because it was too big. And it teaches us one thing. How other people fight the giant may not be your way of fighting the giant. Don't use other people's armor. Allow God to give you armor customized for who you are, how, you're, how, how you think, your attitudes, your giftings, your character, all of this. Your weapons are custom made for you. That's why pretending, we have a lot of preachers pretending they see somebody on TV and they say, I'm going to pretend to be him. You know, I'd I like to be able to shout like T.D. Jakes, but this white boy can't do it. I can't, I tried. It was pitiful. I can't do it like this person. I can't do it like that person. I can't do it, but I can do it the way that I do it. And when I allow who God made me to flow through the weapons that he puts in my hands, it really affects something powerful in the kingdom. Now, you can learn tactics from other people, but God is not calling you to be a clone. God is calling you to be uniquely who you are in Christ. And he picked up five stones. Now, we, we do know that Goliath had four brothers, but I think there was more than that. Five is biblically the number of grace. He picked up grace to attack the giant. They were also smooth stones. That means they were in a brook. It means they have been rubbing up against stuff. They, 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 they've had all the rough edges 
knocked off. Sometimes we don't understand, guys, that some of the hard times that I go through in life is God knocking the rough edges off of my stones by His grace so that when it's time for me to let that stone go, it flies true. And you'll learn that truth if you've ever skipped stones. You can take a stone that's jagged edged and it'll, it, it, won't, it, it doesn't do right, does it? A lot of times this kind of goes, and that's it. How many know when you're, when you're slinging something at the devil, you want to kill him, you don't want it to go. But if you can find a smooth, flat stone, you can make that bad boy just go and go and go and go because there's no resistance there anymore. It flows with the, with the unction that you released it with. And so some of the things that you have been through in life is God loves you enough. God loves you enough to cause you to, to butt heads with brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or this problem or that problem. And your stones start grinding on each other. And God says, keep on grinding, but you got to love them anyway. Because God knows that a year from now, you're going to need to reach into your pocket and you had better had a smooth stone to take down your giant. <laughs> that's how we understand some of the struggles you know i've always wondered why do we go through the struggles we go through because god's preparing you for something like i shared this morning people that ain't been through nothing can't go through nothing you get somebody that's been through something they'll say you know what done a lion done a bear you're next I've seen believers that look like their lives were, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And, and I tell you what, their parents were just all the word. And they, they, they grew in a greenhouse of love and never had a problem. And everything was handed to them on a silver platter. And when they got to be an adult, the first time the devil showed up, they folded. Mama. <laughs> no, you the mama now. You stand up and you fight. Because you're fighting for your babies the same way your mama fought for you. And this ain't a job for grandma. This is a job for mama. This is a job for daddy. If you've been through something, give it to God and he'll cause maturity and wisdom and strength and power to flow through that thing. And you'll find out it becomes a weapon in your hands. Are you having church yet? Let's go down to verse 46 and 47. Now we get into some Holy Ghost trash talk. The, <laughs> Goliath had his say. Now it's David's turn. Goliath said, I'm big, I'm bad, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, and I'm going to take you down, and I'm going to just, I'm going to feed your carcass to, and I'm in this bunch of trash talk about what he could do, he could do, he could do, he could do. This day the Lord... He didn't say, this day David going to take you down. He said, this day the Lord, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down. Notice, the Lord's going to deliver you and I'm going to knock you down. Because I'm in covenant with that Lord and when I raise my hand, He's going to use my hand to pull the hammer down on you. He boasted in the Lord. He knew who he was in covenant with. Sometimes when you have church and you start giving testimonies and you start praising, it's boasting of the Lord. Never get so full of yourself that you can't set yourself down and start talking about the greatness of God. I've been in some ministries where they were in trouble. They got real big. And they stopped putting scriptures on the wall and they started quoting their bishop on the walls of the church. I look at that, uh-oh. Uh, take that down. Put up Jeremiah something or other. Come on now. That may have been an anointed sermon, but it sure doesn't replace Scripture. This day I will deliver you, uh, that God will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. 
I will give the dead bodies of the ark. Because he's not going to stop with you. You know, this is supposed to be you, me, I kill you, they become my slaves. You know, you, you done ticked me off, man. You see that whole army behind you? You're going to be a stepping stone because I'm going to get them too. With five stones and a stick. <laughs> man. And the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and to the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Why a God in Israel? Who was he in covenant with? Israel. There's some giants in Atlanta that God is going to raise up members of this church to take them down so that Atlanta may know that there is a God in Atlanta and that He has a people and that He has a remnant and that He has a people that are strong in Him and in His strength and in His power and stand in His name. And all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Amen. Next time the devil starts mouth-talking you, start talking about Jesus. I've heard it said that any time the devil starts talking to you about your past, start talking to him about his future. Burn, baby, burn. <laughs> you will be the last burnt sacrifice, dude. I have read the end of the book. You make fun of me for confessing that Jesus is my Lord. I found out where you're going to have to kneel in a lake of fire and for all eternity. He's Lord. He's Lord. And I like to write a sign, and he's going to have to confess, and I'm not. Don't make fun of me for serving the one that you're going to have to confess for all eternity that he's the right one. He's the Lord. He's the ruler of heaven and earth. David boasted in, in the Lord and declared the battle belongs to the Lord. And he was just God's delivery man. Learn to be a delivery man or woman for God. You don't have to create it. You don't have to arm it. You don't have to construct it. You just got to deliver it. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's a weapon in me. Yeah, it's waiting to be loosed, guys. It is waiting to be loosed. David, the next of David's secrets we find in 48. And then it happened when the Philistine rose up and came out and drew near to David that David took five steps back and said, Woo, you're big. Is that what it says? <laughs> that David ran quickly toward the battle. Run to your giant. You come to him on your terms. Come on. That's one of the most strategic things of battle is you position yourself. David had already had in his mind, the ground is laying in such a way and that for me to be able to use my sling the best, I need to be there. And so he looked at the battlefield and he strategically placed himself where he needed to be to become the most effective. The devil won't let you do that. He'll try to get you in the kill zone. He'll get you in the bad spot. Put him in the bad spot by knowing exactly where you're supposed to be and you run to engage him. You control the battle. The giant doesn't. Now, the devil may say, well, I got some moves. How many know that Goliath was moving? How many know David had some moves? There's some moves in you that are waiting to be released. Come on now. There's more in you than you could have ever imagined. God's not just walking beside you. He's in you. What is it 
For God to take a rock and fling it to kill a giant when he spoke and flung the universe into existence. That same God that spoke and all matter became, and one day He will pull back the power of His Word, and this entire universe will go up in one big flame. You know, new heaven and new earth is not in our universe. God creates an entirely new dimensional reality that has never been touched by sin, that has completely different uh, physics in it. No sun in the sky... But everything is light. There's no shadow. So you don't even have to have a light in your refrigerator because the light's always on in there because there's no such thing as darkness. You close up a box and the box is filled with light. Completely different physics of that dimensional reality. And it didn't say that God had to work 5,000 years to figure out a way to do that. He just said, there it is. Come on, I'm going to go ahead and bring my house down. And we're, going to, we're, just, I'm going to, we're all going to live in Papa's house. Now, it's so big that the, that planet has to have a bigger atmosphere because it's 120 miles tall. How many know that is way outside the atmosphere on this planet? Nobody's going to have to give you oxygen to go to the top floor either. That's the awesomeness of our God. And that God lives in you. That God lives in you. That not only created varying physics for varying different dimensional realities, he can bend them to his will whenever he wants to. He can walk on water when he needs to. He can tell a prophet, throw in a stick and the axe head will float. Come on now. That's the God in you. That's the God in you. That's the God you're in covenant with. Oh. You guys ready to finish this up? 49 and 50 through 51. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. David didn't stop there. Never, ever, ever show mercy to your giant. He didn't knock him down and walk around saying, I'm the man. I'm the man. All it took was a rock. You know, it could have knocked him out. He didn't stop there. Now listen to this. So thus David prevailing over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword. Now, isn't it interesting that Saul's sword wouldn't do? But then he goes and gets a sword from a giant. It's amazing what you can do when there's some victory on you. And drew it from his sheath and killed him and cut his head off with it. You know why the Philistines ran? He grabbed up his head and started shaking it in the face of the Philistines. Ha-ha! Ha-ha! Who's next? Who's bad now? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He took a boy to take down your champion. Now y'all line up. It's not going to be for an anointing service either. Don't play with the enemy. Show him no mercy. You may knock out that giant. No, you, that, David had that staff in his hand too. If, if that rock would have just glazed off of him, I can imagine David landing right in the middle of his chest and just beating him over the head and bashing his brains in with that staff. I mean, no, he knew how to handle that staff. Talk about kung fu. Whoa! Come on. 
Quit playing with your giant and take him down. Take him out. Absolutely destroy his influence in your life. And I guarantee you, the devil will back off of you for a season. We find that in Jesus. Jesus was in the wilderness, tempted for 40 days, and he confronted, the devil confronted him three times. And it said afterward, and the devil left him for a season. That wasn't for Jesus' benefit. Come on now. He said, you know what? I think I'm going to go sit down for a while. Just think what would happen if this guy would have ate first. <laughs> Come on. Why 40 days? He fasted a day for every year that they wandered in the wilderness in unbelief. Come on. And the whole time they were wandering, they griped because they either didn't get enough to eat, were afraid of what they were going to eat, or afraid there wasn't going to be enough. And then, they, then God gave them manna, and they griped, and he said, I want quail. And he said, you want quail instead of manna? And they ended up, <laughs> he made them need till they ended up puking it up their noses. How many know that's some... <laughs> God says, you know what? Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to enter into my wilderness experience and I'm not eating at all. I'm going to overcome all the griping. And when it was over, the devil left him for a while. When you kill the giant, there will always be a time of great victory and a, and a suspending of battle. Don't waste it. Get stronger in the R&R between battles. Come on now. It's in the downtime, guys, that you need to get into the Word. It's in the downtime that you need to pray so that you're full for battle. Don't wait for battle and say, I think I need to pray. Too late. Come on, too late. You pray and push into God when the devil's not after you so that when he shows up, you knock him down. Mm. there's a giant killer on the inside of you this morning come on now there's a giant killer there's nothing the devil can't bring into your life that God but, but through God you can't take down there's no problem too big there's no situation too great there's no wound too deep there's no baggage from the past that is too heavy for God to deal with. And if you're here this morning, and you've got a giant. I think what I'd like to do is have the elders come down. And what I want them to do, you know, we're always used to pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I want them to anoint you for battle. I want them to pray and to ask God to loose his spirit. How I many know the, the Lord is a man of war, the Bible says, and I want his spirit on the inside of me. I want them to come and anoint you for the battle. I can't take down your giant. Only you can take down your giant. Would you come this morning? Hallelujah, Father God. Hallelujah. Hey, man, I... I ain't seen you this whole trip. Come here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elders, you have the anointing on this house. I commission you in the name of the Lord to anoint and to commission these men and women for battle. Let me give you oil. Let me give you oil if you will come. Can you... Can you help me with that? Get another bottle of oil if we can, so we can go a little bit faster. I'm going to give you this mic back, Bishopis. If you're coming for that anointing, just line up in each of these aisles. If you're coming for that anointing, just line up in each of the aisles. 